So today we'll talk about a different kind of uh, exotic worlds, worlds that are uh, far beyond our solar system. Uh, but before we get to that, um, let me remind you of a simpler time. We all knew what stars were. We knew what planets were. Stars shone by their own light. Planets reflected sunlight. And there were nine of them. Remember that? Yeah. You know, <laughs> things move fast. You guys might forget these things. Um, and that wasn't so long ago. And then um, what happened was a few years ago, astronomers started discovering all these icy bodies in the far reaches of our own solar system. Uh, many of them had moons, just like Pluto did. And at least one of them, which is now uh, appropriately, fittingly named Eris, after the Greek goddess of discord, uh, looked like it might even be a bit bigger than Pluto. So this created a bit of a problem for us. Either we had to elevate it as the 10th planet in the solar system, opening the door for perhaps dozens of others that will be discovered in the next few years, or we had to demote Pluto. And that's what we chose to do uh, and became quite unpopular for it. Um, school children wrote letters to astronomers calling us heartless or worse. Uh, cartoonists had a field day, and there was at least one protest march that I know of. Um, <laughs> I wasn't. And, and it's shocking out of the, you know, close to 2,000 astronomers there, I think a few, a couple of hundred only voted on this. It was important to the rest of the world, apparently not to, not to us. Um, and at least four state legislatures passed resolutions, usually unanimously, declaring that Pluto shall remain a planet. <laughs> you should look up, I'm showing the one from New Mexico, uh, you should look up the one from California, it's quite entertaining. It talks about uh, how this change disturbs Californian sense of cosmic well-being, and they don't quite know how to go about their life, uh, you know, in this new scheme that astronomers are proposing. Um, so what astronomers did instead at the uh, International Astronomical Union meeting uh, in Prague uh, that summer in August was to create a new class of dwarf planets and to put Pluto in there along with Eris uh, plus the biggest of the asteroids in the asteroid belt that's been known for over 200 years. So we have now eight planets and, and, and three dwarf planets uh, in this new scheme in our solar system, and we expect the dwarf planet category to grow quite rapidly in the next uh, few years and decades. But while this has been going on and getting a lot of attention, there really has been a revolution unfolding beyond the shores of our own planetary system. After literally thousands of years of people speculating and over maybe 150 years of people claiming to detect planets beyond our solar system, claims that turned out to be uh, uh, mistaken, um, in the end, in the mid-1990s, astronomers discovered the first planet around a normal star other than the sun. Since then, there have been over 500 confirmed planets um, that we now call extrasolar planets, planets orbiting stars other than the sun. These worlds, many of them, are quite different from anything we know of in our own solar system. Uh, many of them are way too hot uh, uh, compared to anything we know. Some of them are uh, frozen hells. Others of them are bigger than the Earth, the biggest rocky planet in our own solar system. So there's quite a range, and I hope to convey a little bit of that diversity uh, during uh, this talk. The first of these planets uh, was, was discovered in 1995 around a star called 51 Pegasi uh, by these two gentlemen, uh, Michel Mayor and Didier Callot, working at the Geneva Observatory. What they used was a technique that we call the, the wobble method or the Doppler method, where they basically measured the wobble of a star due to the uh, uh, gravitational tug of an unseen planet orbiting that, that star. So this is an idea people had worked on for a long time. They had first tried, uh, as, as my, I describe in my book, for decades to try to measure the wobble of the star on the sky by plotting its position very precisely and trying to see if you could see a wobble in the motion of the star. Instead of mo moving in a straight line, if the star looked like it was wobbling along its path, then maybe something unseen was, was tugging on it. That's not the method that paid off first, it's, it's measuring the wobble using the spectrum of the star. So in the background of this slide, what you see is the spectrum of our own sun, going from the red to the blue, um, and this forest of vertical lines in that spectrum uh, are basically the fingerprints of 
elements in the outer atmosphere of the sun. So uh, these are spectral lines due to a variety of elements, and they have very, they tend to have a very fixed pattern. They fall in very specific set of wavelengths, except when the star moves. So if it's moving away from us or, or towards us, these lines get shifted alternately towards the red and towards the blue. So this is what we call the Doppler shift or the red shift or the blue shift, depending on which direction they go. And that's the effect that allows us to measure the, the component of the wobble of the star towards us and away from us, and therefore the, uh, uh, infer the presence of a planet that's doing the gravitational uh, tugging on that star. This happens in our own solar system, Jupiter being the most pass massive planet uh, in our system is the one that affects the sun the most. That means sun has a 12-year a wobble, which is the period of Jupiter going around the sun. And uh, that's measurable with the current instrumentation. This is a technique that took a long time to, to perfect. And, and one of the other stories I tell in the book is the work of uh, a pioneering group of Canadians, actually, Gordon Walker uh, out in uh, Victoria and his colleagues, who, starting in the 1970s, tried to figure out how do you measure these very small, very subtle shifts in the spectral lines. What you need is a very good ruler. So what they did was to uh, uh, build a little cell of gas, hydrogen fluoride in their case, which is toxic, not something to be playing with at the telescope uh, when you're half, you know, half asleep in the middle of the night. Uh, but that's what they did. They, they, they made this gas cell, and they had the light from the stars passing through the cell because you know where the lines from the, the stationary gas is going to fall, and that provides a ruler against which you can measure the, the shifts of the stellar lines. So it's a pretty neat idea. And uh, later on, other astronomers started to use this uh, with, with much safer iodine as a gas cell. Rather than, rather than hydrogen fluoride. Um, and, and these astronomers, the Canadians as well as many others, including uh, those in, in, in California, many of them were looking for planets like Jupiter in Jupiter-like orbits. What does that mean? That means big, massive planets, but taking a long time to go around their stars. That means they didn't necessarily take data every night. They took data every few weeks over a decade-long period, because that's how you look for a decade-long period planet. Um, sometimes some of them did do observation night after night in an observing run, but never actually searched for periods very short. And then came the surprise of 51 Peg, where there is this a planet with at least half the mass of Jupiter, presumably a gas giant, orbiting that star every four days. So four days, not 12 years. A very unlikely place to find such a gaseous beast. That, that really was the first of many surprises um, in this field in a very short time. So that's much closer than Mercury is in our solar system, and a planet we don't think would have formed so close to its star. Most likely it formed further out and migrated inwards. And that's not something almost any astronomer thought of, except 40 years earlier, um, there's a story of, a, of, a, of a, uh, someone who went on to become an, uh, an important figure in American astronomy called Otto Struve. And his story is yet another one that I tell in the book. It's quite a charming story. He happened to fight in the losing side of the Russian Revolutionary War. His father and grandfather and uncle, I think, were all astronomers. So astronomy really was in his blood. And he was exiled to Turkey, where he basically lived off soup kitchens and worked as a lumberjack and you know, tried to just survive. But he, one of his uncles was in, in Germany, and he wrote a letter to that uncle asking for help to uh, find his way uh, to America. By the time the letter reached him, uh, the uncle had died, but his widow actually put him in touch with an astronomer at the Yerkes Observatory in Chicago, who basically was willing to hire this guy, as he said, you know, on his lineage, right, as an assistant in, in spectroscopy at Yerkes Observatory. And uh, it's, it's quite a charming story I quote from the letters uh, that Otto wrote back in, in, in uh, response to this offer of a job. But he came to the States. He uh, went on to build, uh, play a major role in building up observatories in Texas and, and in Arizona. Uh, but one, in, a, in this incredible two-page simple paper in the 1950s, he predicted that there may be planets that are so close to their stars they only take a, a day to go around their sun. And he in actually foresaw two of the most successful techniques for finding such planets. One was this Doppler method that I mentioned already, which is the one that until recently has been the most successful out of those 500 planets. I think something like 370 of them have been uh, discovered using this method. But the other method that 
uh, and uh, this is uh, an artist's image of what uh, this impression of what one of these hot Jupiters might look like, as we call them now, these incredibly hot worlds uh, so close to their stars. But one of the, the other method that uh, Otto Struve uh, foresaw as a way to find planets is called transits. What you see up on there in the little movie clip is planet Mercury in our own solar system seen to cross in front of the sun. So every once in a while, let me see if I can replay that. Every once in a while, you see the two inner planets of our own solar system, Venus and Mercury, when they're aligned just right from where we are on Earth, we see them as little dots crossing the face of the sun. Now, the same thing could happen with a distant star right there uh, in the other little clip. When a star we look at doesn't appear as the sun, as a big disk in the night sky, it's a point of light. So we don't see a dot uh, when the planet passes in front, but what we do see is the star dimming in brightness by just a little bit because that planet is blocking a small fraction of the star's face as seen from where we are. So a planet about the size of Jupiter blocks about 1% of a starlight for a sun-like star or you know, solar-sized star, I should say. And that means if you monitor the brightness of the star, you see a 1% dip in its brightness just for a few hours while the planet is passing in front. So that's what we call a transit. Now, you have to get lucky, right? Because if a planet isn't aligned right, if its orbit isn't almost perfectly edge on, as seen from where we are, you'd never see it transiting its star. You see it going around this way, which means it'll never be caught in transit. So only some fraction of the stars will we see that way, harboring planets. But it's incredibly successful technique. What you have to do is monitor thousands of stars. So you improve your statistics. In some fraction of them, you'll see uh, uh, some small number of them, you will see planets uh, in transit. What I find really neat about this technique is that uh, all you need are pretty small instruments, telescopes that are much smaller than many amateur astronomers have in their backyard. So this is a set of uh, eight little telescopes mounted on the same mount uh, on, in the Canary Islands off the coast of Spain, uh, one of the most successful transit searches going on. This is, I think it's close to about 40 planets have been discovered with this super WASP system. Yes. Yes, so you're asking, uh, couldn't the variability or the dip in brightness be due to some other process other than a planet? So one, well, it's certainly possible. You have, we, we do know sunspots. Stars presumably have spots. Um, you could have binary companions that have grazing eclipses. So yes, you could be uh, confused. But what you do is, for one thing, uh, transit due to a planet would be uh, extremely precisely periodic. So you can watch multiple transits going on, and the timing is usually extremely precise, unlike is the case for many other forms of activity. So that's probably the simplest answer. Uh, and then you could also observe it at multiple different wavelengths. The color of the eclipse can also kind of help you uh, rule out some of the false possibilities. But I'll come back to that in a second, because that is an important question uh, for something that's coming up. So my point is that this is a, a method that, for the search part, all you need are small telescopes staring at big pieces of the sky, monitoring thousands of, maybe tens of thousands of stars every night, night after night. And the bigger planets are easier to find because they, uh, uh, the, the dip is larger. That's still only 1% for Jupiter. Now, a planet about the size of the Earth will dim the star by one part in 10,000. So that's a little hard to do from the ground. So that's where the Kepler telescope comes in. Uh, this is a uh, a, a telescope launched two, two years ago in March of 2009 by NASA, carries a, a, one, uh, a roughly one meter mirror. And what it's doing is it's uh, in a sun orbit, it's orbiting the sun roughly at the distance of the Earth, and it's staring at one little patch of the sky about the size of my hand at arm's length. That's the size of the sky that it's staring at. And it's gonna stare at it for good three and a half years minimum. So that patch of the sky happens to be uh, somewhere in the between the constellations of Cygnus and Lyra. Uh, and what it's doing is recording the brightness of some 150,000 stars in that patch of the sky very, very precisely. Why three and a half years? Can anybody tell me? Yes? Yes. 
Yes. Exactly. There you go. That's the answer. So if Kepler, you could, that tells you what Kepler is after. It's trying to find Earth-like planets in Earth-like orbits around Sun-like stars. So we want to see three transits. You need to wait three years minimum, right? So that's the idea. So this telescope is basically uh, going to be fantastic at telling us statistics for different kinds of planets. Because it's 150,000 is a pretty small number compared to the 200 billion stars in our galaxy. But it's a decent sample if you want to get some sense of the, how common different kinds of planets are around different kinds of stars. So that's what Kepler is going to be fantastic at, is to give us for the first time the answer to a question like how many roughly Earth-like planets are there around Sun-like stars? How many you know, Jupiter-sized planets are there in one-year periods around red dwarf stars? So those questions will have answers literally within the next two to three years. So already, just from the first year of data that Kepler has gathered, uh, astronomers have announced 1,235 planet candidates just last February. So I make a little bit of a distinction, use the word candidate here, compared to the 500-odd I mentioned before as confirmed planets. And the reason for that is this gentleman's question, which is these are not independently confirmed in other ways. So we just have transits, and there could be a small number of at least false positives in that data set, in the sense that the interpretation may not necessarily have to be a planet. So the, the Kepler team is getting very good at ruling out a lot of those false positives, but a few could still be left. So a few percent of that 1,235 may not be real planets. So they're doing follow-up. For a handful of them, they're going to try to get velocities, get the spectra, measure the velocities, so you have independent confirmation of their masses, not just the size. And when you can do both, it's really interesting. And I'll get back to that point. When you have a mass and a size, you can get a density. And that tells you something about what kind of material a planet is made of. So that's extremely interesting. Now, one of the systems um, that Kepler found planets around is exceptionally intriguing. It saw six different planets transiting the same star. Okay, six planet transiting system. So you could see the transits of all of these six planets. Yes. It's pretty. It's pretty thin. It's pretty well in the same plane. So this would imply exactly what you're asking, which is for us to see all of six of them transiting their star, it must be pretty well in the same plane, all these planets. What's even more cooler is that five of these six planets, and by the way, they're all roughly Neptune-sized planets, so they're kind of big by Earth standards. Five of the six, their orbits fit within the orbit of Mercury in our solar system. So that's incredibly densely packed planetary system. Most theoretical astrophysicists would not have predicted anything so rich. So nature is turning out to be a lot more uh, wondrous and a lot more prolific in making planets and making incredibly rich planetary systems. Be yeah. The, uh, the star is fairly old, so it's, it's at least you know, in the order of billions of years. So it's not a young system that's unstable. It looks like it is stable. They have done the calculation, and for the particular planets that masses that we can estimate, this is a stable system. What's even cooler is that because they're so tensely packed, um, from timing the transits, a Kepler scientist actually can watch the gravitational influence of the planets on each other. It's really like seeing kind of the dance of the planets with each other choreographed by gravity. Because they're so close to each other, the, you know, their the, the gravitational tug on each other is measurable just from timing the transit. Because if you get, you know, sometimes a transit would happen just slightly too early, sometimes just slightly too late, because depending on the positions of the other four of the five planets. And that's incredibly beautiful to be able to see in nature in real time the motion of the planets and the gravitational tug of the planets on each other reflected in those motions. So it's a really beautiful system, one that we wouldn't have predicted. Just wanted to show you that as an example of the kind of surprises that continue to uh, come up in, in this uh, very exciting business. So this is just a very quick summary of what kind of um, planets these uh, planet candidates these Kepler ones are. 
uh, as you can tell, a lot of them, uh, the peak is around Neptune size. So a lot of the 1,200 plus plant candidates, half of them seem to be roughly about the size of Neptune. The handful that are bigger, like Jupiter, a few that are even bigger than Jupiter. And then the low mass end of this spectrum, there's quite a few that are we call a super Earth, a planet that's only a few times more massive than the Earth, tend to be typically uh, between one and maybe three Earth radii. And then a, a few dozen that are roughly the size of the Earth. Now, this half of the diagram of this histogram is, should be taken with caution because the smaller planets, as you can imagine, are harder to tease out of the data. So the scientists are still learning how to push the limits of detection. So this part, it may be, it turns out, is a rising function in the end that there may still be many more smaller planets than there are Neptunes. We just don't know that yet. That side of the diagram is probably real, will stand in the sense there are more of Neptune-sized planets than there are uh, Jupiter-sized ones. There's a question. Okay, so when I say size, I mean uh, radius or diameter, the actual size. When I say mass, I mean the amount of mass, okay? So uh, transits only give you the size. The radial velocity or the Doppler method gives you a minimum mass. When you have both, then you can get a density, if you have a size and a mass. But if you have only one, then you can't. Now, for the six-planet system, uh, even without uh, having uh, velocity measurements, you could get masses for all the planets. Because of this interaction among them gives, gives us additional information about their masses. So you know the orbits, and you can solve for the masses just from the transits. But you can do that only because there's multiple planets seen in transit and because you can do the timing of those transits. Generally, you need the Doppler method in order to be able to see, uh, the, get the mass. Now, these Neptune-sized planets and the ones that I call super-Earths, what are they? And this is where having both a size and a mass would tell us a lot. So this is roughly a, a schematic of what radius of size of Jupiter versus what two possibilities for what these super-Earth planets might be. For the same mass, they could be bigger if they're lower density, meaning they're, for example, primarily icy rather than rocky. So for the same mass, you could have a much smaller, more densely packed planet that we could be a rocky planet, or you could have a bigger, less dense, icy, or maybe primarily a mix of gas and ice and rock kind of planet that will give you a bigger radius. So this is where measuring the radius, the size, in addition to the mass, will help us distinguish between these two kinds of possibilities for what these super-Earths are. And that's important because there are no super-Earths in the solar system. The biggest rocky planet is the Earth, and that's where we happen to be. So it's an intriguing question, for example, uh, that you might want to think about is, are super-Earths going to be habitable? I mean, some people have argued that we, you know, we need plate tectonics for stable climate on Earth. Well, maybe super-Earths, as long as they're not way too uh, 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 much, much more massive than, than the Earth, may have more vigorous plate tectonics and might help recycle uh, through the long-term carbon cycle, for example, better if you had more mass, if you had more vigorous uh, plate tectonics. Others have argued that that you know, super-Earth might be actually much less habitable because some things get locked in quickly and you wouldn't have the nutrients you need on the surface in the oceans to, uh, to harbor life. So there's a whole range of interesting questions that come up when you think about uh, planets that don't exist in our system that are being discovered elsewhere. Now, as I said, Kepler is a fantastic instrument. It'll answer age-old questions about how common are other roughly Earth-sized planets. What it is not going to be so great at is m the vast majority of those planets it's going to find are going to be around stars that are so far away that they're too faint for us to do a lot of detailed follow-up. Okay, So it would be fantastic at statistics, not so great at giving you nearby examples to go l dig into in detail. Okay, So for that, we depend on other complementary searchers from the ground. An example is this M-Earth project, which is a using eight telescopes uh, in Arizona. is led by David Charbonneau at Harvard. And what they're doing is with these eight telescopes, they're targeting one by one the nearest couple of thousand red dwarf stars. 
Why red dwarf stars? Because they're smaller, so a, a super Earth would cover a bigger fraction of their surface, so the transit depth will be a bit bigger, making it easier to do it even from the ground. The same kind of planet around a sun-like star would have a transit depth too small to measure from the ground. So that's why you go after the smaller stars, but you go after the nearest examples of those small stars so that you have a chance of following them up with other techniques. So this is a search that's going on right now. Will, is finding or will find uh, candidates, super Earths, that are much better suited to follow up because they happen to be nearby, their stars are brighter, and there's a chance that one of them might turn out to be in the habitable zone, this magical place where it, you can have liquid water, where it's not too hot, not too cold, the Goldilocks zone that everybody's interested in. Yes. Yes, so because it's going after the nearest stars, it has to do them one by one because they're all spread out through the sky. So that's why there are eight telescopes to speed up the search. So you can do eight at a time uh, rather than one at a time, but it still means you want to spend several days to a week per star, per telescope. So it takes a while to get through. But in a few years, they've figured out, in two to three years, I think they get, get enough of a sample. Um, they already had their first discovery of a super-Earth, and that's around a star called GJ1214, just 45 light years away, which is pretty close by our standards. It's in our cosmic backyard. Uh, what's neat about it is, as you can see, they were able to make the measurements in transit and go follow up with spectra and get the velocities. So now you have the wobble and you have the transit, which means you have uh, an inference of mass and radius and therefore density. Okay, And that density is somewhere between what the Earth would be, a rocky planet would be, and what a gaseous planet like Jupiter would be. Earth would be about 5,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So it's a lot less dense than the Earth on average. What that means is it could either be kind of a scaled-down mini Neptune, like an icy, primarily icy uh, ball uh, of material, or it could be a scaled-up Super Earth, a rocky planet, but with a pretty dense atmosphere, for example, made of water vapor or carbon dioxide, or something like that. You need a substantial gaseous component. All of it can't be rocky for that radius. Otherwise, you'd have a much greater density. Okay? So that means there are at least a couple of different possibilities of what kind of planet this might be. So how could we tell? Because it's nearby, because the star is relatively bright, a number of groups have tried to actually follow this up. So here's the work done by um, my student, my PhD student, Bryce Kroll. Uh, what we've been doing is looking at this nearby super-Earth transiting planet with the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope, which is a three-and-a-half-meter telescope on top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. It's pretty modest by today's standards. It's sort of a medium-sized telescope by today's standards, the kind of you know, telescopes we let grad students play with. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, actually, well, we do let them play with the bigger ones, too. But the interesting thing here is that because we are sitting here on Earth, we have to do, deal with the Earth's atmosphere, which is changing all the time, right? So if you go make a measurement tonight and come back for the next transit a few days from now and make a measurement at a different wavelength, you can't compare them very well because the water vapor content in the Earth's atmosphere may be different on the two nights. So you have to be slightly cleverer and you make simultaneous measurements. So that's what we did. We did we sort of flip back and forth between a wavelength in this part of the infrared and over there. And the reason for that, this plot looks a little complicated, but it doesn't have to be, let me show you. Basically, there's just two options. One, this kind of flat curve is what models predict for a, for a water-heavy atmosphere, a kind of a water world kind of uh, atmosphere, rocky planet with a water vapor-rich or carbon dioxide-rich atmosphere, because the atmosphere would have a small scale height. It'll be more compact, and that will give you this sort of a, a spectrum in the near infrared. Now, if you had an a atmosphere that's primarily of lighter gases like hydrogen and helium, the same amount will be bigger. It'll be less dense and then a, a bigger radius for the atmosphere. And then you could have molecules at high, at large scale heights that do absorption at different wavelengths, at particular wavelengths. So therefore, you get this other a uh, much more variable spectrum if it is a planet that's primarily made of light gases with a mix of, say, methane, for example, will give you a feature over here, an absorption feature over here. So what we did was to switch back and forth between these two wavelengths 
and make measurements simultaneously, literally flipping back and forth between two different filters and making measurements. And we made measurements that you can see a number of different transits, just to be sure we got it right, because it's a very tough measurement to do from the ground. Uh, and what we found is that indeed our measurements are much more consistent with the scaled down version of Neptune. Now that's in some sense disappointing if you're looking for life or looking for habitable worlds. On the other hand, I think the good news is here's the first nearby transiting super Earth and here we are using a modest sized ground based telescope to make measurements of its atmosphere. I think that's remarkable. To be able to do that, sitting here on the ground with existing instruments that were not built for planets or planet searches or anything, we're characterizing nearby super-Earth planet atmospheres. That's pretty neat. That's a lot of fun. Just a few days of telescope time, you get an answer. I think that bodes really well uh, for what's coming next. Yes? Are you taking the spectrum? Are you taking the spectrum during the transit of the transmitted light? So this, this, these measurements are during transit. So what we're effectively doing in this case, because we're basically taking, uh, this is the model spectrum. So what we actually take is uh, flux measurements at two different wavelengths. So what you're doing is effectively measuring the radius of the planet at two different wavelengths, right? So in the wavelength where there is absorption due to some molecule, you'll have a different radius than a wavelength where you don't. So that's what we're measuring. And that ratio is what's telling us uh, what that you know, scale height of the atmosphere is. But let me answer your second question with the next slide, which leads on to, as you said, in the simple-minded way that I've talked about transits so far, you have a planet in front of a star, it blocks some starlight, the star gets a bit dimmer. But if you think about it in a little bit more detail, which is, I think, what you're asking, you may have some of that starlight actually skimming through the outer layers of the atmosphere before reaching us or before reaching the Hubble Space Telescope in that case, then you could do a very interesting differential measurement. Even though you can't take a picture of the planet separate from the star, the planet is hidden in the glare of the star, you can take a measurement when the planet is in front of the star and when it's not. You difference the two, any leftover, the, any extra absorption, must be due to whatever is in the atmosphere of that planet. So this kind of differential measurement is quite common in science. It's particularly common in astronomy. Things we can't measure in an absolute sense, we can measure in a differential sense. And that's exactly what people have been doing. So in this case, by taking a measurement of uh, this is the first transiting planet that was discovered, uh, Dave Charbonneau and his colleagues were able to actually see an uh, imprint of sodium in the atmosphere of that planet in the star spectrum. So you're not separately taking an uh, image or a spectrum of the, of the planet separate from the star. What you're seeing is the imprint of the planet's atmosphere on the stellar spectrum by doing this differential measurement. The extra little absorption is what we're measuring. So you can push this further, and people have used the Spitzer Space Telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope, and even from the ground, try to detect other interesting uh, atoms and molecules. And there's claim of a detection of water. There's claims of detection of methane and carbon monoxide. Yes. No, what you're measuring is the light of the star passing through the planet's atmosphere. So we call it transmission spectroscopy, not reflected light. Or not, yeah, does that make? It's refracted through the atmosphere of the planet. So it's coming through rather than being reflected. Right? The planet is between us and the star when these measurements are made. You could. So maybe my next slide will explain, well, kind of answer your question. Okay? Because, so I'm still talking about the primary transit when the planet is in front of the star. But you're, you're making an interesting point. So the next thing I want to get to is exactly what you're getting at. You're one step ahead of me. So if you look at this little uh, 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 cartoon movie, what you see are kind of the faces of the planet, just like there's faces of the moon and faces of Venus in our solar system. Just before and just after it comes out of, from behind the star, you see a full planet, fully illuminated day side. And as it comes to the front, the transit, which is what I've been talking about all this time, what you're seeing is actually the night side. Because the day side is facing the star, not us. And it comes around, it gets from crescent planet to full planet, there it is. 
That is what we call an eclipse or the secondary eclipse, the one when the planet goes behind the star. And then what you're measuring, if you were able to measure that secondary eclipse, not the primary transit, if you're able to measure the secondary eclipse, again in a different sort of way, you measure star plus planet minus just the star, what's left should be the emission from the planet itself. And that's exactly what we're doing now. We're getting, you know, you can do the transits, it's easy, let's try something harder. This was first achieved with the Spitzer Space Telescope, which is an infrared-sensitive uh, telescope in space. But in the last few years, a number of groups have actually managed to do this right here from the ground. Again, my student Bryce Kroll and colleagues, we use the, uh, with, with, with our colleagues, we use the Canada France Hawaii Telescope now to take the best measurements of thermal emission from these hot Jupiters here from the ground. What we're doing is making measurements of the secondary eclipse, and we do it at a number of different wavelengths. So here's uh, our best case where we measured at three different filters in the near infrared part of the spectrum the, the little dip. And you can see those are pretty darn good measurements, right? I mean, they're not bad at all, considering all the challenge we have dealing with the Earth's own atmosphere. We've developed the techniques to make these differential measurements extremely precisely. And what that allows you to do is when you see this day side that's illuminated by the star and you take a measurement of it as a ratio between the stellar and the planetary flux, what you're measuring is actually the uh, thermal emission from the planet. Another way to put it is we're taking temperature of the planet's day side. So this is a distant planet orbiting a distant star. We don't have a picture of it separate from the star. And here we are taking its temperature from a distance. That's, again, pretty neat. You know, we're not just finding planets, we're characterizing them. We're starting to treat them as real worlds, like the way we treat planets in our own solar system. Can't quite send spacecraft there, but from a distance, we're doing a little bit of remote sensing of what's going on in their atmospheres. So this particular planet for which I'm showing you our data uh, happens to be incredibly red, uh, hot. That's about 3,000 Kelvin in the day side. It's an incredibly hot atmosphere. Now, for some of the planets, it's interesting, at roughly the same distance from the star, some of them have a big difference between the day and the night side temperatures. Some of them are roughly the same. So that's telling you, because the day side is what's getting blasted by stellar radiation, that in some cases it's transported to the backside by winds, and in other cases not so well. So you could either have a very big day-night contrast, or you could have a pretty well uh, circulated uh, uh, planet planet with good circulation of heat all around it. Yes. Yeah, very good question. So most of these planets that are so close that have only a few days, you know, that only take a few days to go around their star, they're so close to their star, we expect them all to be tidally locked. In other words, just like the moon is always showing the same face to the Earth, we expect these planets to be always the same half of it to be facing its, its star. So almost certainly all of them are likely tidally locked. But that still means, well, so that means how does the night side get any heat? Only if it's transported through the atmosphere of the planet. And that means we're really kind of probing the atmospheres of these worlds at different depths by taking measurements at different wavelengths. Because different wavelengths probe different depths in the atmosphere of the planet. So we're starting to even be able to kind of make rather crude maps of the thermal uh, circulation of these worlds. Which again, I think is really, you know, incredible considering, you know, how recent these discoveries are and considering how, you know, primitive our technology is relative to what we're trying to do, trying to do this remote sensing of planets from such a great distance. Now, all this time I've been talking about planets that we don't have pictures of, planets that we need to do all kinds of tricks to find them and then to characterize them, and they usually have to be in a lucky situation, for example, caught in transit for us to play some of these tricks. Now, the reason for all that is, of course, because planets are so faint compared to the stars that they orbit. So here's just a, a, a logarithmic plot on this side showing you at different uh, wavelengths, different parts of the spectrum, how, uh, bright, how much brighter the sun is compared to three planets in our own solar system. So this is the visible part of the spectrum where we, our eyes are sensitive, and you can see the sun is several hundred million times brighter than even Jupiter several hundred million times brighter than Jupiter. Okay? If you go into the infrared, to the longer wavelength, it's a little bit better because the sun gets dimmer and the planets get a little brighter because they're so much cooler than the star. 
still not enough. It's pretty darn challenging. I say it's a little bit like trying to see uh, little embers against a bright searchlight from a distance. The little embers will be all hidden in the glare of the bright searchlight. You would not see them. So that's the challenge that we're facing when you try to take pictures of planets orbiting other stars. And yet, we did it three years ago. Here's a, a star that's roughly the mass of the sun. And there, over at the top left, is a little dot. And that little dot, we could take a separate, because they're separate. This is a real picture. Here's a star. Here's a companion. We were actually able to take spectra of the star and the planet separately and show here's the spectrum of the star, which is pretty boring, and here's the spectrum in the black of the planet, and it's compared to a bunch of different things. But this shape is due to water molecules, for example, absorbing uh, uh, in, in the atmosphere of that world. And the presence of those molecules, the presence of those absorption features tell us the temperature of the atmosphere of that world. And that's way too cold to be a star. So that's how we knew that this is not just a chance alignment of a distant background star that looks faint just because it's much further away next to a, a, a more nearby star. So it's not a chance alignment. It indeed is a cool object that this was right next to a star. So what helped us? I told you all this time how hard it is to take a picture. Well, here we did it. How did we do it? A number of things helped. One, we targeted young stars with young planets. And the secret there is when planets are young, especially gas giants like Jupiter are young, they're still contracting. They're still shrinking in size, and therefore they're converting gravitational energy into heat. That means they don't just depend on you know, reflecting sunlight for us to be able to see them, but they actually emit their own heat. They're hotter, and they have their own emission, not just the reflected light from the star. That makes them much brighter than they would be otherwise. So an old Jupiter, like ours, will be several hundred million times fainter than the sun in the optical. A planet like this is only 10,000 to 100,000 times fainter than its star at a young age of just a few million years. That may not seem like much, but it's enough for us to make this detection. Another thing that helped, this planet is pretty massive. It's about eight times the mass of Jupiter. But because of the way the, the, the equation of state is, it's not much bigger than Jupiter, surprisingly. Well, it's bigger because it's young, but it'll actually become roughly the radius of Jupiter over time because it's a de degenerate object. Now, the, it's massive so, and young and hot, but the other thing is also it's pretty far away from its star compared to the planets in our solar system. This planet is at least 11 times further away from its star than Neptune is in our solar system. So it's way out there. And we don't quite know how it got there. It might have been hurled out there by planet-planet interactions, or it may have formed very differently from the planets we thought formed in a protoplanetary disk, like in our solar system. Yes? If it's so far away, how does it find it? Oh, being far away from the star helps us. Because... Yes. So this was not found by either of those methods. This was found by direct imaging. This is a completely new, different technique. You actually search by doing imaging of young stars looking for companions. So indeed, you're right. So this direct imaging is much more sensitive to star planets further away, which is quite complementary to transit and wobble methods, which are much more sensitive to planets closer in, right? So if you want to know the whole planet population, you need all the techniques. And the, so it's further away. And the fourth thing that helped is a technology called adaptive optics. Some of you may have heard of this. Basically, what you have is a secondary mirror inside your instrument that changes shape many times a second because of all these actuators on the back. So it's a feedback loop that measures the distortion due to the Earth's atmosphere, corrects for it by changing the shape of the mirror in real time, and that allows us to take much sharper images from the ground than we could otherwise. So without actually going into space, from a ground-based telescope like Gemini, which is what we used for this one, an 8-meter telescope in Hawaii, we could take this very sharp picture, which allows you to concentrate the starlight as much as possible so you can see faint dots next to it. So in other words, we're basically taking the twinkle out of the stars. Okay? Sounds kind of, you know, dull and unpoetic, but it really helps us get sharper pictures of the stars and therefore be able to see uh, their companions. Yes. It's
Exactly. So, well, both in the sense that it hasn't had time to cool down, but it's also still producing heat by contraction. So not by nuclear reactions, just gravitational energy being converted to heat. Okay, so that's why it's so hot. So over time, it will cool down. It'll just take a long time to cool down over, to, you know, uh, to what we're used to. So uh, being so far away from the IAU definition of planet. I'll show you in a second. I'll show you in a second. Before that, we made a tabloid in Sweden. That's when you know you made it in life, right? Any scientist can get it written up in the New York Times. Come on. And 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 in true tabloid fashion, they you know hyped it as an Earth-like world, which. I hope by now you get that it most certainly is not in, in every possible way you can think of. It's not Earth-like. Um, and thing, one thing we didn't have, I thought you'll challenge me on that. Hi, Kat, I didn't see you. Uh, um, one, one thing that we didn't have at the time when we announced this in September of 2008 was actually proof that the two of these two objects are moving together on the sky, the star and the companion. Okay, We showed we had a spectrum so we could tell the companion was cool and therefore not just a background star but still you know there was a tiny little bit of a if you want to seal the deal you want to really show that two physically bound to each other that's what we've done over the last couple of years we've taken observations uh, that show this companion is indeed bound and not a background object that happens to be in the same line of sight so now we have sealed the deal the they have a lot to do with each other. They're physically bound. They seem to be moving together on the sky. Because the planet is so far away from the star, it takes a while before we can see orbital motion. Not as long as you might think. I think in, we estimated in close less than a decade, you should see a little bit of the arc of the orbital motion. Okay. Time goes quickly. It's already been three years. Give us three or four more years and we'll actually show you. It's orbiting, right? That's pretty neat. Uh, but anyway, so that's, that's where it is. And you, to answer your question, geez, you guys anticipate all my slides. This is wonderful. Uh, we don't officially have a real definition of a planet cut off at the high end. We had the debate about the low end, which is what I started this talk with about Pluto, where to draw the line. We don't officially have a line drawn uh, at the high end. The working definition the International Astronomical Union has is that it's less than the mass of deuterium burning, which is about 13 Jupiter masses, so eight, eight Jupiter masses, it meets that. And it says, it doesn't matter how you form the companion, as long as it's that mass, and it orbits a star, you call it a planet. So this is a planet by that definition. Which, now, except it hasn't cleared out its... Yeah, that was my question. Oh, it definitely has, because it's incredibly massive. It would have cleared out its surrounding. If we got a 30 AU... Oh, yeah. yeah, that, yeah. that was my question. Oh, I see. Whether it has had enough time? Yeah, has it, you know, being so far away, could it possibly have cleared out its orbit? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, the more massive it is, the, and there's less dust out there than there's closer in. The density of a disk is less. Okay. Yeah, that's not a huge issue. Now, what's interesting is just within a couple of months of our announcement in September 2008, three other groups announced direct pictures of planets. The one that got the most press was this one. It's a, a star called Formalhout with its dust ring left over. The star has been subtracted out. That's why it's dark in the middle. But what astronomers were able to see with, a, with two Hubble Space Telescope images in 2004 and 2006 was this, was this little dot. And it looked like it was moving in a way that it could be in orbit around that star. And it's embedded in this dust ring, kind of like the Kuiper belt in our solar system. It's sort of encircling the planets. It made a nice story. Now, I'm going to get in trouble because this is going to be on, on, on video. I am most skeptical of that one, of the ones that have been announced so far. It got a lot of press because it was a NASA press conference, it was a Hubble discovery. But the challenge is that, you know, three years later, there hasn't been a paper that's shown, you know, detected it again, recovered it again. I just had an email exchange with, the, with Paul Callas, who was involved in this discovery. They have found another spec like that in more recent data from last September. They haven't been able to quite tell whether it's moving in the right way to be identified with the previous specs seen in previous epochs. So there's a little bit of uncertainty, and I'm willing to bet, um, I'm not going to go into all the technical details, I'm willing to bet they actually have not detected any light coming directly from a planet in that case. And that's the sentence that's going to get me in trouble. Um, they may have, you know, they may have detected, reflected light from a cloud of dust, something to do with the protoplanet, but I don't think the light is coming straight from a planet in that particular case. Okay. 
And a number of observations in the infrared from the ground have not detected it. There are upper limits, and that really aren't consistent with the original claim. What's interesting, uh, more, much more secure, uh, the one up, one of them is the one up there. Those two dots are actually the same planet. It's embedded in a disk seen edge on. It's a famous star called Beta Pictoris, the first one around which astronomers were able to see a dust disk because it happened to be edge on. And those two dots are the same object seen on one side of the star and five years later on the other side of the star, as if it, it has indeed been orbiting that star. So that's pretty secure, that there's a real object there. It's pretty massive, about eight times the mass of Jupiter again, much closer in than the one I talked about before, that you can actually see a full orbit in a less than a decade. Okay, So that's pretty neat. The one that I think is the most spectacular is this one. It's a star with a three-planet system, all three of them seen in this one image. So it's a family portrait of another planetary system. You know, very nice. And over a couple of years, because this star is nearer to us, and because the planets are a little bit closer in, still pretty far by solar system standards, but much closer in than the one I talked about before, you could actually see little arcs of the orbital motion just in a couple of years. And they did. So this is led by Christian Marois, who is now at the Hertzberg Institute in, in Victoria, and his colleagues. It's really neat. Again, using adaptive optics on Gemini and Keck telescopes in Hawaii. So when my former postdoc at the time, David Lafreniere, was involved in that discovery, and he decided, why don't I take a look at the publicly available Hubble image archive and see if I can find any of these planets? Because there happened to be an image of that star taken by Hubble 10 years earlier, in 1998. With a little bit of fancy processing, out pops the outermost of those three directly imaged planets in that system. So all this time I was trying to convince you, astronomers are so clever, we do these incredibly precise measurements. Here we you know, could have had our first directly imaged planets 10 years earlier, had we been a little cleverer and working harder. Of course I'm making the story a little simple. It's easier to find things when you know where they are, where to look. It's a lot simpler. But, and also the image processing techniques have uh, made significant advances since then. So that's why he was able to recover it. What's cool about it is that all of a sudden now, instead of a two-year arc, you have a 10-year arc for the orbit of this planet. You don't have to wait 10 years to get it. You have it from 10 years ago. So it's really neat. It could constrain the orbit better. What's even more incredible is that Christian Marois and his colleagues found a fourth planet, in a fourth planet in that system. Just last December they announced this. So here's a star with the four planets all directly imaged, all seem to seem to be orbiting that star, and they're all pretty massive. These are between about 7 and 11 times the mass of Jupiter, each of them. Now, this system, because there are four of them, and because we can see the orbital motion, is very consistent with all four being in the same plane. The orbits of all four seem to be in the same plane. That's highly suggestive that they formed out of a disk of dust and gas, which is how we think our solar system plants formed. But again, nobody would have predicted such hefty planets to form out of a dust disk that's typically seen in around other young stars. Well, it's, that's a good question. So this star is a bit more massive than the Sun. So the more massive stars may have more massive disks. And this may also be the unusually you know, heavy end of the spectrum, right? You may have a range of planetary systems or protoplanetary disks, and this might have been at the high end of the mass for protoplanetary disks. So that's possible. But it's still really intriguing that such massive planets can form and survive in the same plane in orbits. Uh, well, it's certainly much closer in than any of these planets, right? I mean, these are still tens of astronomical units away from the star. Uh, so what's exciting, what I was very busy with all this month, uh, in addition to the book tour, was putting together a proposal to compete to get time on an upcoming instrument at the Gemini South Telescope. What this is, is both the Gemini South Telescope and the European Very Large Telescope, which is in Chile as well, they're both getting the next generation adaptive optics instruments. So these, instead of having dozens of actuators in the back of the secondary mirror, will have thousands. So the correction will be a lot better and that means we can get much sharper images and achieve much higher contrast between the star and companions by also suppressing the light with a chronographic spot, for example, suppressing the star itself so you can see something faint next to it. 
So a number of teams are competing for this. Uh, you know, I put together a team of 22 scientists from all the Gemini partner countries, and we wrote a proposal. We know a number of other teams are going to do the same. So there'll be a competition to decide which one or two teams get uh, many, many uh, 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 nights on, the neck, on this instrument for the next three years to be able to do a survey of nearby stars looking for planetary systems. So instead of showing you pictures of just three or four or five planets in a couple of years or three years, I hope to be able to show you dozens of family portraits of other planetary systems. I mean, that's the pace of discovery. It's a fast-moving field where you go from, you know, the glimpse of, of the most massive systems to hopefully being able to observe, take pictures of, and take spectra of dozens of planetary systems in the next few years. A little bit further down the road is the successor to Hubble, the James Webb Space Telescope, a six-and-a-half-meter mirror telescope to be launched into space. It's been delayed again a little bit, budget problems, so it may not be even till 2018 that it gets launched. But one of the goals of this uh, mission is indeed planet hunting. Not so much planet hunting, but plant characterization. One is for imaging, that's a simulation of what that three-planet system, before we knew about the fourth one, would look like in a simulation uh, for the James Webb Space Telescope. But it will also have spectrographs that we can take spectra, transmission spectra of planets in transit. And it will be very easy to do that uh, for planets that are big, like Jupiter. Still pretty damn hard. This is kind of crappy signal-to-noise spectra that you get for Earth's, super-Earth-sized planets. That's still pretty challenging. So while the pay, you know, it's been incredible progress, the next step of actually looking for biosignatures, having a chance of detecting them, things like oxygen, methane, ozone, carbon monoxide, in the atmosphere of a relatively small, likely rocky super-Earth, is going to be still quite challenging. Okay? That may really take a whole another step. It may take the building of the next generation of ground-based instruments with 20, 30-meter mirrors, or a, next, you know, or a dedicated space mission with a much smaller mirror, but targeted for that particular purpose. So in order to find biosignatures around a nearby transiting planet that's rocky, that's relatively small, we have to be exceptionally lucky to do that with, even with James Webb. It has to be a planet around one of the nearest, nearest red dwarfs caught in transit for us to even have a chance of doing it. And even then, it would take many, 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 many hours of observation continuously with this telescope to get enough signal to noise. So that's going to be pretty tough. But, you know, as, as it has been happen, happening in this field over and over again, presumably there'll be a lot of interesting uh, technological developments, there'll be enough interest uh, uh, and political will and financial resources to invest in it because of the discoveries that Kepler is making, that discoveries that are being made from the ground. There's a lot of public interest, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, people see it as being so close to answering a big age-old question that there may be enough impetus to get there. Just to remind you, at the end, the pace of discovery that we've seen so far. And this is until last year, this is before the Kepler discoveries, Starting in the mid-1990s, just look at how many planets have been discovered beyond our solar system every year. It's a rapidly rising uh, arc. And just last year, before Kepler, over 100 planets were found in one year alone. So finding extrasolar planets is no longer news. You read about them you know, every other week in the, in the paper. But finding unusual planets, exploring the full parameter space, just understanding the full diversity of worlds out there and the full diversity of architectures of planetary systems out there is really an ongoing process. It's very exciting. Um, I quote another astronomer in the book saying, it really has this feeling of being in the Wild West, where the discoveries are being made left, right, and center. There's a, you know, people from all walks of life are playing a role in it. Uh, I tell a charming story of a, of a housewife in New Zealand that played a crucial role in discovering planets with a yet another technique called microlensing. And at the time, she didn't even know what microlensing was. Uh, she learned about it after the fact. But there's, you know, and I already gave you some glimpse of what my own graduate student is doing. There's quite a range of people that have come into this game, and it's, it's, it's sort of a flourishing time. It's a very exciting time. Literally, on a weekly basis, uh, there's interesting uh, developments. So I'll end there uh, and, and, and sort of tell you that it really feels like being part of an unfolding revolution in understanding our place in the universe. And I sort of think in, in some ways it's not much of an exaggeration to say it's a little bit like when Galileo first turned his telescope to the heavens. In particular, when he could see the four moons of Jupiter orbiting it and show people, look, not everything in the universe is revolving around the Earth. There was, here's the evidence. 
It's not just a theory. Here's the evidence. You can see these moons. You can plot their positions, you know, and show that these moons are indeed orbiting that planet. And I think, in some sense, we're kind of, you know, completing that Copernican revolution by really understanding that our solar system, our planetary system, is just one among so many, and there's such a huge range of diversity of systems out there. And in some level, we've come. We've come far. We've really, in the last 20 years, made incredible progress. We still don't have the answer to the big question. Well, one of the answers will come with Kepler. We will know how common roughly Earth-sized planets are. Yet the big question of, you know, are we alone? Is there other life? That's still a little ways to go. And even if we detect biosignatures in the atmosphere of one of these worlds, that still doesn't tell you whether it's slime or civilization. Right? And that might make a difference to most people. Uh, even though I think once you have life independently originating in two places, then that definitely raises the question of why not a billion other places. So I'll end with that. Thank you very much. Yes. Twenty billion seems awfully low. Yeah. <laughs> How many do you want? Well, you know, there are of stars, yeah. So, so the latest number that I have seen um, uh, that I talk to Kepler people about is what they can say is at least forty percent of the stars have planets in that field. Forty percent. That's a lot. So, and that's the minimum, right? That's that's only within the planets within about fifty day periods. That's just inside that. So just to be clear, they're taking the, 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 the yeah. transiting, and then they're assuming that they're in the Exactly. It's a ge correction for the geometric. So, is it, uh, so I want to ask the question, is this in correlation between the angular momentum of these clouds and planets and the actual angular Very little, or none that we know of. So, so the, the scales are so different. Uh, between an individual planetary system and what's going on in the galaxy, they're pretty much decoupled. Yeah, I mean they're basically making a geometric correction and a correction for some uh, limits in the data processing up to this point, uh, but also the uh, period of observing, right? So you can't catch a planet in a you know one-year orbit yet. So they're just that's why it's very much a minimum. But to me, that's still a pretty large minimum, 40%. Um, and the other number that comes to play is that when, you know, I mean, for my thesis, uh, I used to work on protoplanetary disks, and a number that comes out of that is that, you know, almost every star is born with the stuff to make planets. You know, some 90% of the stars at a million years have protoplanetary disks. Now, whether they all make planets or not, we don't know. That's why we have Kepler. But they at least have the potential, right? They have the, the stuff to make planets. So it really is likely to be a pretty large number. And the other thing is, you know, I, I hope you got some glimpse of you know, how prolific nature is in producing planets uh, from the glimpses we have. That's not definite statistics, but it really seems there's some very rich systems. Yes? Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's science. You don't know till you know, right? Well, I mean... Uh, good question. I can't remember that. I, I can't remember that fraction. Um, how many of the ones they've seen are multiple systems? I can't remember that, sorry. Uh, but I mean, usually the multiple planet systems are pretty common. I mean, from the ground-based surveys, you know, at least a third tend to be multiple. And if you can make one, usually you can make more. And, and these all have, you know, selection effects. You're still only finding from the ground-based surveys the big ones. So there's plenty of chances that there are smaller ones we can't see yet. Yes. Not for the same, not for detection reasons, because the bigger the planet is, the bigger the dip in brightness of the star during a transit, there's really no reason not to be able to find them. Now, there could be confusion at that end. You could have, for example, more false positives there, because, for example, one of the false positives that can happen is that you can have a binary star system, and then the third one that happens to be in the same line of sight or with a third companion that's further away, and that one could have like a grazing eclipse. So your depth isn't very large of the eclipse, but that's because only 1% of it gets covered. It's a grazing eclipse, not a full-on eclipse. Um, 
usually you can tell that with just a star and a star. You could tell that from the shape of the dip. But when you have this sort of complicated triple system sort of thing, you can sometimes get fooled. So maybe, you know, those things that look like they had radii much bigger than Jupiter, they're actually quite puzzling if they're real planets. Because of the way the equation of state works for anything like Jupiter or bigger, the radii tend to be roughly the same for a whole range of masses. You know, even an old brown dwarf is roughly the size of Jupiter, even though it's more massive, uh, you know. Um, so those are actually kind of puzzling. So you could have more false positives there. I don't think you're going to have detection sort of selection effects as strongly at that end. Yes. Question in the back, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> uh, you're putting me on the spot. Uh, well, for some very particular projects, it is quite effective, right? So even even in the, um, I'll just give you an example from extrasolar planet world. Um, so there are planets that are discovered through the the wobble method, and for each of them, you can calculate, given what you know about the orbit, what chance there is that it might even be actually be transiting. And um, there's Greg Laughlin, who's a professor at UC Santa Cruz, who sort of marshaled a number of amateur astronomers around the world to, you know, because you can predict if there's a transit, when it would be, get these people to go out and observe, even with pretty small telescopes, and and and, and find them. Now, um, in terms of, I think you're talking about even sort of large num larger numbers of people uh, working with data online. For very specific, well-designed projects, it's quite useful, right? So we don't have to have armies of graduate students uh, uh, looking through lots and lots of images. It is useful. Uh, I think it depends a lot on the design. It depends on having a particular kind. You know, it, it, I don't think it works for every kind of science. It works for certain particular questions that involve massive sets of data where a pair of eyes can do better than most algorithms still. So that's where I think it's most effective. Okay, thank you very much. All right.